Now, the main definition of a stem cell is really incredibly simple. Is that when a stem cell divides to give rise to two daughter cells, on the average, one is still a stem cell. And the other daughter cell is a short-term cell which can't continue forever to make more of itself. Uh, I'm looking if people who are sitting on the steps would move up a step. There's still people out there who could take a chair when a student gets up out of their chair to sit on a step. Oh, I can see this is really moving fast. <laughs> anyway, so that's it. It's a simple definition. And of all the cells in your body, the only ones that make more of themselves are stem cells. So if you think about it, all the others are moving down the stream to make whatever tissue they're supposed to make. They have limited lifespans. So for the whole of your lifetime, the regeneration of your tissue is from stem cells. Blood forming stem cells from the blood, for the blood, lung for the lung, brain for the brain, and so on. Every one of them is still working in all of us, or else you wouldn't be here. <coughs> we began to look for the blood forming stem cell, mainly because we thought it would be interesting, and also because the whole of bone marrow transplantation, the ability to try to replace a defective or a destroyed blood forming system with a healthy one, we found depended on blood forming stem cells. Now, it's got a whole bunch of stuff. What you should be seeing here is that cell can self renew. And it goes through sets to finally make the mature blood cells, which are here. <clears throat> After Hiroshima and Nagasaki bomb, the people who died with the lowest dose of radiation that killed died because it got to a dose that wiped out their blood forming stem cells. So our idea is to now take advantage of that horrible mishap to try to understand and treat disease. You can find blood forming stem cells in the bone marrow. It's there in all of us. You can find it, pop down to the third one, in the umbilical cord blood. They happen to be in transit as a baby is being formed, so that if you look in the blood coming from the umbilical cord, there will be plenty of stem cells there. The blood forming stem cells that are in the umbilical cord can make blood and only blood. They can't be used to repair the heart, repair the brain, or any other tissue, no matter what you hear from somebody else. <laughs> the third place is called mobilized blood. This really came from the bone marrow transplant community. They found when they were treating cancer patients with higher and higher doses of chemotherapy, if they would stop the chemotherapy, they would see there's at least one seat here for one of you. They would see cells appearing in the blood which had the potential to make more blood cells. Way back when we were working on stem cells, we found out the cells that they saw were in fact blood forming stem cells that emerged from the bone marrow to go into the blood and we later found that was to replenish a place where a stem cell lives <laughs> called a niche where the stem cell had died. So normally throughout our lifespan we have small numbers of our blood forming stem cells going from the bone marrow to the blood to replace another cell in the bone. If that weren't true the practice of bone marrow transplantation wouldn't work. Because who would have thought that you could take <coughs> cells from a stable tissue, put them in the blood, and they would go back exactly and only to that tissue to restore the blood. I can tell you right now, if you take all the brain stem cells out of your brain and you put them in your blood, not one of them will know how to go back to the brain. And as Mark hinted, the molecules that they use to guide them out of the bone into the blood and then from the blood to another bone are homing receptors and they are the molecules that he and I and uh, he's my scientific grandchild 
<laughs> Gene Butcher was my uh, postdoc that we all spent so much time on. Now, that's good. You can't even see the top. The top says, <laughs> and I'm not going to bother to change it, removal of contaminating cancer cells from stem cell grafts. So now we were looking for applications. We had isolated in 1988 the mouse blood forming stem cell, and we showed that it could save lethally irradiated mice. We had isolated at a company I co-founded called Systemics, the human blood forming stem cell, and we showed that it could restore the blood formation in a mouse that had human bone, bone marrow, thymus, and so on in it. After you irradiated that, you could put in the cells back in the bloodstream of the mouse, and they would regenerate the human blood forming system and immune system. So knowing that, we then turned to cancer therapy, and we was the company. Uh, and let me just say that this was the first stem cell company, and the people who put their money out there took it, put it out at great risk, because nobody knew if this could turn into a science that had a clinical practice to it. But anyway, it was the practice of the time to do, quote, stem cell therapy for breast cancer. Probably somebody in this room had it. But what they were doing was taking the mobilized blood from a woman that had widespread breast cancer, freezing it down in a way to keep the cells alive, treating her with massive doses of chemotherapy, and then putting back the mobilized peripheral blood. Well, we wanted to be able to isolate from the mobilized peripheral blood pure stem cells. And I'll just say that we were able to do this kind of a research because of groundbreaking work at Stanford by the Hertzenbergs to make a machine that would sort cells individually and at high rates, up to 40,000 cells per second. We were also able to separate the cells because Kohler and Milstein had found a way to make pre-designed antibody molecules which could bind to the surface of some but not all the cells, which we could attach a fluorescent tag to and then run through the cell sorter and tell the cell sorter to give us green, red, and blue but not yellow cells. And it could do that by this simple mechanism. So we depended on a lot of optics, mechanics, electronics, to be able to move forward. And that's something that is important to understand, especially at a place like Montana State, which is excellent in engineering, computer sciences, and the life sciences, and is sure to get better, even though it's already excellent. <laughs> so we wanted to have pure stem cells, because we thought giving cancer cells back to a woman with breast cancer couldn't be good. So we found this way to isolate pure stem cells, and we showed directly there were no cancer cells in it. And this is a trial that went on from December 1996 until they accrued all of the patients, a small trial, uh, the end of 1998. This is the probability, 100% or zero, that somebody is alive or alive without breast cancer. This is the time they were transplanted. And what you're looking at is the result of our study. So at four years, for example, we had about 60-some percent, if I could see it, that are alive but could have disease, but of them, 37%, I can't even see, yeah, 37% alive without disease. So that was pretty high. At the time we published that, both now from our retrospective study and this study, giving back all of the cells, including cancer, the stem cell therapy most people got, was only 6% alive without disease at two years. Now, right about 
here, the company that bought my company shut down stem cell transplant. Because they couldn't see how it would make their minimum standard of income per year. It was, as they say, a business decision. It was a company, it's a big pharmaceutical company, and it was stretching far enough to buy part of our company, or all of it eventually, but not far enough for them to understand the culture and the science we were doing. We just, that's over here, you can't see it, reviewed at 14 years. And this is alive without disease, alive, one third of the patients. Now I can promise you if that was a pill, or even a protein, everybody would be getting it. There's no question. But because it was a cell therapy, and they didn't see how to make $500 million a year, their minimum standard, we don't have that as a therapy. So I just finished negotiating with that company to get all of the rights back to the university, and we're going to redo the trial. But this is an example that you may not believe that the function of a company is to make a profit. The function of a medical school or a life sciences institution is to advance medical science for the health and welfare of humans. And it's only rarely that those things converge. So you have to understand if it's going to happen, it has to happen in a new form and a new kind of a business because, again, no university is Montana State Inc. or Stanford Inc. Their universities where discoveries are made and maybe the preclinical uh, proof of principle that it might be important or might be useful. But making it into a therapy, at least in America, means you've got to have a company. And now it says we have to have a company that understands more. We have just as good or better results in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We didn't have anything as good in multiple myeloma. The three diseases, we could finish an initial trial before they shut it down. But there's more to it. So when you transplant, let's say, Mark has a disease or took a drug so that his blood forming system isn't functioning just right. Let's imagine I'm his brother and that we're HLA match, that is, we're pretty closely related, but obviously different. He's got a lot more hair on his head. <laughs> but it's different. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's another sign of aging. <laughs> Anyway, transplanting my mobilized peripheral blood or bone marrow to replace his defective system after a radiation. So we wipe out his immune system, wipe out his blood forming stem cells, replace it with mine. Would be good except that I have already formed immune cells called T cells whose job is to kill cells that are foreign or cells that are infected. That's how they protect us. Well, if his skin graft on my body would reject because my T cells would see it as foreign, my T cells would reject his skin in his body. And he would get open sores. And his mucosa, his mouth, open sores. And his liver, huge hidden sores. And his lung. And all of the efforts of the doctors would be to keep him alive with high dose immunosuppressive drugs for months. But for many people, that led to the cure of the leukemia or the lymphoma they had. So it was worth it. But what if you had a disease like sickle cell disease, where your hemoglobin has a mutation and it's going to kill you by somewhere in your 20s, or Mediterranean anemia, or the bubble boy disease. You were born without an immune system. These are all diseases of the blood forming system. You always need to replace a defective system 
with blood forming cells that are not defective. So when we first did in mice, mouse to mouse, then into mice that had human blood forming and immune system, transplants, if we did the whole mobilized blood that got graft versus host disease, if we transferred only the stem cells, there was no immune reaction against the host. No need for hospitalization. No high cost for the intensive care. And you ended up with a host, Mark, with my blood forming and immune system. Now, as I'll show you, that has a lot of benefits that Mark didn't even think of. But if you, la if you use pure stem cells, you can try to get it to an era of transplantation where you can take on a lot of troubling disease of the blood forming system. If you transplant, that's me, that's Mark, <laughs> after radiation, blood forming stem cells, and then the same day or even a year later is where he gets his benefit, my heart. The heart tissue that is genetically this is from the same donor as the blood forming stem cell needs no immunosuppression to be taken because the immune system that derives from his stem cells growing up in my body deletes any cell that would be immune reactive against him or me, but allows third party transplants to be recognized as foreign and rejected. So what does that mean in real terms? If we could do stem cell transplants from donor to host with pure stem cells and with minimal conditioning like radiation or chemo, everybody who needed a heart or lung or kidney or skin transplant could have it where the only time they get serious drugs is when they get the transplant. So that would be a revolution. And many more people would be eligible to be recipients. Let's hope this one shows. Otherwise, I'm going to go back and put the dark guy in. Is it real bad? No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Well, we'll see if it's fine. <laughs> How many lines do you see? <laughs> So anyway, there are certain genes that have variations, called alleles or mutations, which predispose to diseases where you don't delete all of the T cells that you're making that would be against yourself. One of them is juvenile or type 1 diabetes. <coughs> diabetes is not a disease of the insulin producing cells of the pancreas. It's a disease of the immune system, a collection of genes that you inherited from your parents. The unlucky roll of their genetic dice gave the kid who gets diabetes susceptibility that somewhere when they're young or teenager, the T cell immune reaction against their own islets destroys the islets. And that happens in a mouse model of that disease with virtually the same genes at about four to six months of age. So we said, what if we get rid of that abusive immune system by conditioning with the radiation or chemotherapy or antibodies and now replace that with fresh cells? Well, if we did fresh cells from the animal that is the same strain that can get diabetes, you gain a month or two. That is the only clinical trial that's gone on so far for type 1 diabetes. But you would say, well, look at we know if you give mobilized peripheral blood, there are T cells there. T cells cause diabetes by killing the islets. Let's just give back stem cells and set the immunological clock back to zero. Another couple months, that's the one you can't see. I can hardly see it. Another couple months. But they have the same predilection for the disease. But if you give stem cells from a donor that is genetically resistant to getting diabetes, there's at least one in every family. It's a cure. If you give it before you lose all the insulin-producing cells, 
This is the result. If they've already lost all of their insulin producing cells and can't regenerate it, you give stem cells from the resistant donor, it stops the autoimmune attack, but they can't turn into insulin producing cells. So Judy Shizuru and I transplanted insulin producing cells and blood forming stem cells from the diabetes resistant donor and, oops, this could be, that's what uh, this little tiny thing is, could be from somebody that's very compatible, an easy transplant to do, but has at least three diabetes resistance genes. It's a permanent cure. Now we published this 12 years ago, and we have still not been able to get funds to carry that forward because nobody's got a business model in mind. Or the people who take care of patients with diabetes say they're doing fine, and they are doing fine according to the doctor. But if you're a teenager or a young kid with diabetes, all you're thinking about every day, all day, is insulin, sugar, insulin, sugar. And your life isn't going to be as long as anybody else. So part of our problem in moving this forward is the inherent conservatism of physicians as well as the public, and of course the lack of any business plan that they would accept to carry forward. And these are important issues because they're the issues that separate these therapies from you and what can happen. Now, it is great to be conservative and not try crazy schemes because that is what is life sustaining. But not so great if you take that over into an area outside of your area of competence. So what autoimmune diseases are really approachable like this? Lupus. There's a mouse model we've cured with stem cells from donors. Judy Shizuru has cured the mouse model of multiple sclerosis. Even rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis, if you had a safe way to transplant stem cells. So that means we have to look to see can we replace chemotherapy and radiation somehow to treat these diseases. So here was our first clue. Now remember I said that once in a while a blood forming stem cell in a normal person goes out into the blood and comes back. When it goes into the blood it leaves its home or its niche. So that's empty for a short time. Deep Bhattacharya and I, that's him down there, transplanted mouse blood forming stem cells that we had a genetic marker into untreated mice with severe combined immunodeficiency. About a half a percent of the niches were open at the time we transplanted, and we restored half a percent of the niches. That's what that little set of dots there says. This is just a control. But because they had no immune system, even that worked, and it restored their blood forming system we could immunize them, we could infect them, they were cured of the disease. Now, there are children who have received, usually mothers, mobilized peripheral blood transplants, they get them past the Graffer's Zos disease, and they survive, but because it's only a half a percent of engraftment, eventually it goes away and then they're in need. So we looked for a way to replace radiation. <coughs> and we, meaning Anishka Chekovitz, which was done when she was an undergraduate at Stanford and then finished as a medical student at Deep Denied, we found with one dose of an antibody that we had found that would cut off the food supply to stem cells, for the scientists in the audience, a blocking antibody to see kit. We switched from a half a percent engraftment to 15%. And if we did it three times in a row, the antibody, then stem cells, antibody, stem cell, antibody, stem cells, a week apart, we got 90% in 
grafted. So we just, two days ago, applied to the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine to fund a trial for an antibody we have that starves the human stem cells. And we have a collection of patients who failed their grafts and others rarely who come up. And we'll see what happens. First, will they fund us? And the second, we have a trial. Now, let me just mention something. We applied for a grant that's $20 million. Ask Mark how many times he's written a grant for 20 million bucks and had a chance of getting it. We created, we that is, people of California, a proposition called Proposition 71 in California that was presented in 2004 to the public as a constitutional amendment. It had to be a constitutional amendment to approve and fund all kinds of stem cell research, including the kind banned by the federal government to be funded for research. It was the parents of diabetics that led the charge. And we wrote in that that we should be able to fund research not only at the discovery phase and the preclinical mouse proof of principle, but through phase one and maybe even phase two, that is the early stage FDA sponsored trials. And it got funded. Well, many of you know, and I'm sure Mark knows acutely that the venture capital funding for biomedical research is almost completely gone. The federal funding for anything smacking of stem cells, but certainly certain kinds of stem cells, is extremely low. California passed 59% to 41% the stem cell proposition to set aside money to cover spending of three billion dollars over 10 years, exclusively for stem cell research, exclusively to be spent in California. In that was 300 million to build facilities and recruit new people. And most of them are built and being recruited, including it covered a quarter of our costs. Because every penny spent has to go to California if it can, all of the construction workers, the architects, the builders, the people who sell the equipment, the employees in the building, had to be California. And although you've heard that California is failing because of other financial adventures, and we're all failing because somehow a small group of people transferred a large amount of money out of the public domain into their pockets, it's funded. And as a constitutional amendment, it can be spent in any institution of the state, whether it is a state college or university or not. So Stanford even could apply. And uh, the legislature can do nothing to change the funding for 10 years because it was a constitutional amendment. It funds itself through bonds. And the only reason I'm going into that detail is to say this was a grassroots movement of the only people who were never at the table when venture capitalists and academics tried to do something. It was patient advocates. So when your bill is passed in Washington, there's nobody who is a patient advocate who actually gets in there and says it. So when the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine was set up, one-third of the oversight board is patient advocate group representatives. Now, they can be a pain in the butt, because they always want you to do tomorrow what can't be done in a day. But it's the constant drive of people with the disease and the family members of people with the disease that keep it going even if it ain't going to make 500 million bucks in three years. This is something Montana could learn even in hard times. You have great biomedical institutions, from McLaughlin to the state universities and so on. And what do they need? 
security and funding if they keep up good work over a 10 year span. That's what our, that's what our contract is with the people of California. It's worth thinking about. Okay. From less controversial to even more controversial. <laughs> so when we were looking at blood forming stem cells and the fact that you could induce this lifelong tolerance, I thought we ought to be able to find other <clears throat> tissue stem cells so that we could co-transplant eventually blood forming stem cell and another tissue. Well, the first tissue we picked was brain because it was the hardest one. Most of you were taught that by age 13 you've got about as many brain cells as you're ever going to have and that every drink you took, <laughs> raise your hands if that's what you thought of. <laughs> it's not true at all. That was conventional wisdom from people who looked at sections of dead people's brains. In fact, if you put in a marker that sees dividing cells, there are two hot spots at least in every one of us. Bigger, one of the hot spots bigger in mice because it makes the cells that receive the signals from odorants and the odorant receptor cells because mice have to live by smell. We obviously don't do that so well. But there's another place in the brain, that little tooth like structure, which makes tens of thousands of new cells every day dedicated to short-term learning. If you kill or prevent those cells from dividing, you do it for a few days, I could be sitting here, I could recognize those of you who I knew before, turn my head, turn back, and I'm starting all over again. Life is in the moment. You don't have a chance for short-term memory. That tells us something important. There are dividing cells in the brain that contribute to new learning. So that's sort of use it or lose it. If you don't keep them need, a need for them, they may not do it. So for many reasons, we began the isolation of human brain stem cells. We isolated them from human fetuses. So already now I've gone beyond the barrier. <laughs> the group that received the tissue from dead fetuses is not for profit and not connected to us. The women who decided to have an abortion signed a piece of paper that, before anything was told them, that they were irrevocably committed as a personal choice to have the abortion. After the dead fetus was obtained, then the third party group said, well, can the tissue be used for medical research? And I'm saying this because I know it's a tough one for a lot of people to think about. But keep it in mind. So from those cells, we were able to isolate cells that at the single cell level could make balls of hundreds of thousands of cells that were still at the level of a brain-forming cell. We transplanted those cells, like we always do, into an immune-deficient mouse into the brain and the remarkable thing is, 47 weeks later, the cells that are going to support smelling, even though they were humans who have weak capacity, had migrated down and formed the layer of cells that received the signal from the odorant receptor cells in the nose uh, and, well, nose. The cells that make insulators around the axons, called oligodendrocytes, were insulating mouse axons. The cells that support brain cells in many ways that we don't even know, called astrocytes. In each of these, the human cells are in a site-appropriate fashion, <coughs> proliferating, migrating, differentiating, and functioning. And when we looked at the area that they're migrating, 
you see tracts of cells, a significant percentage of which are human, 1% or more. When you look at the site where they're still dividing to make more stem cells, the human ones are dividing. That's what all that complicated stuff says. Well, it says to me that now we have a new way to study the central nervous system and especially the central nervous system of humans. Because we can reduce it to cells which we can put in and in a site appropriate fashion. They do their job. Well, there's something else here. People have diseases of that central nervous system. Here's a child who was born perfectly normal until age one or two developed perfectly normally and then started having difficult in vision and then when it hit what's called the cerebellum difficulty in coordination and got what's called ataxia and then when it hit the part that's the learning part that tooth-like structure started losing IQ and every one of these children go from brains here full of brain tissue to brains here where there's just a little thrim cortex and the fluid that normally bathes the brain enlarges to fill the empty space. This is called Batten disease. They didn't do anything wrong to get this disease. They inherited one gene defect. And it was in an enzyme that cuts fat away from proteins so that you can break down the fatty fat into fatty acids, the proteins to amino acids. It's just sort of a garbage dump. And the part of the cell that has the garbage dump is called the lice. It lyses somebody. The lysosomes of those kids fill up with undegraded material. It breaks it open and the cell dies. It takes a long time for you to understand what it's doing. But it is always fatal. Sandra Hoffman at the University of Texas Southwestern made a mouse with exactly the same genetic defect. And see, there's that tooth-like place where you form new cells. This is the cells they connect to for learning. And this is absent compared to a normal. So a huge loss of cells in a particularly incredibly important area for learning. And that's just looking at that place. Now, the company that I co-founded called Stem Cells Inc. isolated the human stem cells and transplanted into immune deficient mice that had that bat disease. And it went from here with a million cells to here with three million to there. And now we're up to virtually total protection. Now, the cells that are here are not human. This is a disease where Healthy cells make the enzyme that's missing, tag it with a sugar called mannose, export it into the bloodstream, and every other cell in the body has a receptor to bind proteins that have mannose. And they take it in, and where do they take it to? The lysosome. So by transplanting healthy, <coughs> albeit human, brain stem cells into this deficient mouse, we finally got enough distribution of the cells from just those few entry sites to have blockade a progression of the disease. So we went to a few universities and said, this is where, this is where it is. This is an incredible, here we have all the preclinical proof of principle. The FDA says, go find a university and do it. <laughs> and we were even turned down by one prestigious university by them saying, well, we won't allow you to start a clinical trial with cells that have never been tested so long as you put it in children. This is a fallout of a bad episode at another university. So all they excluded was any test of this disease for children because nobody gets out of childhood with this disease. So it was done at the University of Oregon, first with late phase and then earlier phase patients. And we'll see, hopefully, if it gets funding, how it goes forward. Got to remember, it's still in the business sphere. Here's another disease that you know a lot more about. It's called spinal cord injury. Most of the spinal cord injuries are crush injuries. 
It's only in the samurai movies that you slice through the spinal cord. <laughs> it's an important distinction because in the area of the crush, you lose the blood supply for a few days, and the cells that have their cell bodies die. But the brain cells, the motor neurons, are up here, way up here, and they send a long fiber that goes right through that area. And the pain fiber ones are down here, and they send a long fiber that goes up and tells the brain. Their cell bodies were not affected by the lack of nutrition. But the cells that insulated the electrical impulse, where I think, move my finger, and instantaneously I move my finger, where I feel a pain and I can do it right away, well, it just slows to a crawl and effectively doesn't happen. So mice that have that crush injury, this is done at the Irvine Reeves Center by Eileen Anderson and Brian Cummings, they have a real defect. And we transplanted human stem cells above and below the lesion. Now for those who think mathematically, this is a logarithmic scale. So it's tenfold better and tenfold better and tenfold better here. They start off with an injury which leaves them paralyzed, their hind limbs. And if you give, if you give them things just to overcoat, overcome the inflammation and give them cells that can't turn into the insulator cells, they get up to this level which means no walking, no feeling, but you're still alive. But if you give them human brain stem cells, they're walking in a coordinated fashion. And then, if you put in a toxin that kills the human cells and not the mouse cells, oh, oh well, trust me, because <laughs> you lose the picture, that's all. They become paralyzed again. So what we showed in that experiment was that human brain stem cells, as stem cells, can respond to the injured spinal cord by making oligodendrocyte progenitors, the insulator cells, and they wrap the mouse axons. So that has now been approved to go forward in a clinical trial. It's going to go on in, in Switzerland, where you might imagine, with the ski slopes and the other stuff, have a lot of spinal cord injury patients. But again, we would never have gotten if we didn't step over the boundary putting human brain cells in a mouse and human brain cells that came from human fetal tissue. So you have to ask yourself, was it important enough to do when, oh God, Kansas Senator Brombe. See, that's Alzheimer's creeping in. <laughs> Senator Brownback heard of our experiment and introduced a bill into Congress to ban any experiment where you put human cells of any type into a mouse. A million dollar fine, 10 years in jail. So I would be in jail if Brownback's bill had been passed and uh, the then President Bush in the 2006 uh, uh, annual address State of the Union address said that I backed the Brownback bill to ban that. So I happened to be testifying in the Senate in Brownback's committee, and I said, look at this. <laughs> Every one of these diseases are diseases where we can learn more and maybe <laughs> do something about the disease. Which of these shouldn't we do? And he says, it's just morally wrong. You shouldn't do any of them. Well, I hope that's where you can at least make a distinction that you can have strong political ground beliefs and strong religious beliefs, but in this country, nobody has the right to impose their political and religious beliefs without at least going through Congress or a constitutional amendment. So luckily, Congress stopped his bill, and we can still do the research. But it's almost there. It's always waiting around the corner, and you better pay close attention to what the bill says, because it'll always sound like we're murderers when we do these experiments. 
This is just to say, I'm not going to go into it, that we have isolated also, it was an undergraduate at Stanford working with us, Richard Sherwood, the mouse muscle forming stem cell. And it was the only cell we found that could regenerate the muscle that had been injured by a toxin or have muscular dystrophy. And it cures muscular dystrophy in the mice. The only problem is you've got to put in one stem cell for every group of muscles. So it'll be a surgeon's heyday when they go through and do it, but they will do it because it works. And remember, the definition of a stem cell is a cell that by self-renewal lasts for life. So stem cell therapies, every one I've showed you so far, are lifetime treatments done once. And if you can't get your head around how to make money about that, then you don't know how to talk to insurance companies and people. Okay, so blood forming stem cells regenerate blood forming in the immune system. Brain forming, for brain, I showed you. Mainly we showed the neuroprotective rather than restoring bad thinking. Whatever that is. There's skin forming stem cells, uh, skeletal muscle stem cells, and there are many that we haven't discovered yet. Now, you can barely see this, but in the early 2000s, fueled by I don't know what, people started saying that blood forming stem cells, if they went to the brain, could form brain. If they went to the heart, they could be heart or skeletal muscle or lung. And that brain forming stem cells could form blood. Well, you must imagine that I was co-founder of a company that had all rights to do blood forming stem cells. At that time, and another brain forming stem cells. So we could cure every disease if that was right. The only problem is, it's not right. That blood-forming stem cells only make blood, brain-forming stem cells only make brain. Yet, as I mentioned, if you go on a website for stem cell cures, you will see everywhere that umbilical cord stem cells will cure holes in your heart or fix a neurodegenerative disease. They are unproven stem cell therapies. The only thing you should remember here is that there is a website um, www.closerlookatstemcells.org. I was president last year of the International Stem Cell Society. When I gave a talk exactly like this in Great Falls at the Benefits Hospital to the group of people like you who comes to the talk, and I came to this point and went on to the end of the talk, there were about 180 people in the room. Two came down to me and they paid one fifty thousand, one eighty-five thousand dollars of their hard-earned money that they couldn't afford to phony stem cell practitioners. The two questions you always have to ask are, show me the document that shows that you tested it successfully in a patient population that was overseen by what's called an institutional review board at the hospital. And second, show me the FDA or the FDA-like approval. Otherwise, you're dealing with somebody whose main job, like a company, is to make money. And I can't understand the heart of people that do this, but they do it all the time. This is a several billion dollar a year business. If over 1% of rural Montana ranchers have already paid the money, and those are the ones who volunteered to tell me, this is a serious problem. So there is a need for stem cell therapies. People just have to help us get there with the right stem cell therapies, rather than the fakes. This is almost illegible. <laughs> so I'll walk you through it. What I'm going to try to get, can I take one minute? I'm going to fix this. So I think it's saying I'm going to save this. back, get a little darker, okay, <laughs> oh god, why it's perfect, one more try, not so strong, 
of my class in high school, college, or medical school. That's why this is such a challenge. I have friends here who will attest to it. So normally when an egg is fertilized, you start the process that's going to lead to the formation of the body. The egg drops out of the, the ovary, is fertilized by a sperm, and as it travels down toward the uterus, it divides about eight times to form an entity called the blastocyst. I wish we had a different name for it, but that's it. It's pre-implantation. This, when you take the cells out of the middle, the cells in the middle are going to become the cells that eventually become body cells. The cells on the ball that surrounds it are the attachment sites to the uterus. If the blastocyst does not attached to the uterus, it doesn't receive the signals to make an embryo. As embryologists define it, I'm not going to get into other definitions just to say that. So you can take those cells out and you can give them a factor they've never seen to turn them into a stem cell line called embryonic stem cells. Each of those cells has the possibility, if we remove the factor that keeps them dividing, to eventually form tissue stem cells and the cells of a tissue, but completely disorganized. That's the magic of what's called embryonic stem cell research, is you have, in a Petri dish, the cells that eventually can make every cell type of the body. Now, I made it seem easy by the isolation of mouse blood forming, then human blood forming, then human brain forming, mouse muscle forming, and we've done a few others. But that's 20 to 30 years of work. In two years, with an embryonic stem cell line, we're very close and probably have the cardiac stem cell. Because those cells make beating muscle, and you find the cell in between that makes beating muscle. It's not so hard. So that's why it's so important to use the very best cell lines to do that. So we can understand at a cellular level what goes on, and then of course once you get them from this cell culture, you go back with the antibodies that mark the stem cell and see if you can find them somewhere in the developing or developed heart. Same for other tissues. Now, I'll take you through it. I'm not going to screw around with that. <laughs> Dark or light. It's been known that if you take cells from a person, actually from a mouse is what's really known, or a sheep, and you take out the nucleus, which has the genetic material, that's what that is, and you put it into an egg from the same species from which its own genetic instructions, chromosomes, were removed. The only genetic instructions it has are from that adult, and they might be from the skin, where they turn on the genes to make skin, turn off the genes to be pluripotent, turn off the genes to be brain cells or immune cells. So the whole thing is set up but what happens is you can go back and reprogram it once in a while. Nobody's done it in humans yet, but it's been done in all other species. And that can be used to get, take the inner cell mass to make a blastocyst that makes a cell line. So that sounds all pretty academic. <clears throat> At least in mice and in sheep. If you take that cell from somebody that has a genetic disease, because they were born with the genetic disease. The cell line has that same genetic disease. If it's from, say, Parkinson's, because that was just done at Stanford, not exactly this way, but I'll tell you where. The nervous system cells that are made, when they make the cells that are lost in Parkinson's, mainly what's called dopaminergic neurons, and I can barely remember it, those cells from Parkinson's patients die with almost any insult. And from normal people, stay alive. So now we know and have cells in a dish 
or that we can put into a mouse's brain to start tracking Parkinson's. It's the same for every other genetic disease. So the reason we fought so hard for trying to get that route to make pluripotent stem cells is because we could capture human diseases and then give everybody who's a scientist who works on it anywhere the cells to study the disease. Of course, that's not fundable in the United States. Luckily, Shinji Yamanaka, who was at San Francisco and Kyoto, found a mixture of four genes which can take those skin cells right to those cells. Now, they're not exactly the same. We don't know if they're going to work the same. And the four genes alone each are cancer genes and could cause cancer. But it's opened the door for people to start this kind of study and try to validate this approach. So, now we're about a third of the way through, right? <laughs> <laughs> the promise of regenerative medicine for the long distance future is to prepare those pluripotent stem cell lines from a thousand different people that have a thousand different matching antigens for transplantation. To isolate and prepare transplantable blood forming stem cells, we'll use those to induce tolerance. To isolate other tissue stem cells that are needed, either from one that's normal or fixed genetically one that's abnormal, and co-transplant them, and then using methods that I just showed you the approach with one antibody to transplant without high-dose radiation the two cell types to treat the disease. That's what we're aiming at. And that, of course, is unprecedented. That, of course, also is still got all the barriers. I don't need to mention them again. Now, the final part, because this is kind of a surprise. We wanted to apply stem cell thinking to cancers. And as I say, cancers don't come from Mars. They come from our own tissues. Leukemias come from the blood-forming tissue. Lymphomas from the immune tissue. Glioblastoma, medulloblastoma from brain tissue. Lung cancer, obviously, from lung breast, and so on. Well, what we found is that within every cancer, you have a subset of cells that self-renew. And they still try to make the tissue they were supposed to make. And the daughter cells they make don't self-renew. And about 5% of the cells are the self-renewing tumor stem cells, and 95% their daughter cells. Now, all therapies for cancer, with very few exceptions, are therapies where pharmaceutical companies or NIH empirically goes through a batch of chemicals, first on a cell line, to say, can I kill the cancer in vitro? And if they kill 90, 95% of the cells, they say, let's go ahead with that compound. Then they repeat it again in mice that have long transplanted tumors. These are cells that have gone so many steps beyond the cancer that's in the body that they do relate to them, but they aren't the same as the cancer we have. But when they do that, again, they say, shrink 90% of the cells. So when Mike Clark, Tanisha Tanisha Sean Morrison and I, and then Max Dean looked at cancer stem cells, we found that they had built-in molecules that transport drugs out of them. And they had a system of enzymes that sops up the oxygen-free radicals that radiation induces. Not completely in either way, but enough that when you give the dose that kills 90% of the outside cells, you only kill about 10% of them. So every cancer therapy that we have and the art of combination chemotherapy and the art of the oncologist is aiming to try to get rid of not only those daughter cells, but the cancer stem cell as well. So we began in the late 1990s to isolate cancer stem cells. And we first isolated one from a mouse leukemia where we could transplant the leukemia with that cell but with none of the daughter cells into mice that were immune deficient. 
Then we looked at the genes expressed by them. And as I said, they were more resistant to radiation and more resistant to chemotherapy than the normal cells. But then we looked at leukemias in humans. And we found this is a horrible diagram that shows blood-forming stem cells making blood. And down here is the leukemia that came up. And what I'm going backwards in this diagram is to show you that many genetic and other heritable chains in gene expression had to occur to finally get that leukemia. We looked at people who got acute leukemia in Hiroshima after the bomb, and we found at least nine independent steps required to make the leukemia. At the core of all those steps is the first step, which is supposed to have a one in it. And if it happens in a blood-forming stem cell, by self-renewal, it's fixed into the blood-forming pool. If that first step had occurred here or here or here, those are not self-renewing cells. And it would be lost with the lifespan of those cells. So the take-home lesson here in the one system that we know all of the cells that make blood is you start always to make the pre-leukemic steps in the only self-renewing cells of the tissue, the stem cells. But for some reason that we still don't understand, we have never, ever seen a leukemia of stem cells. 